Hello, welcome to the home of the Ghost Owl. We're now on the final category in the High Elf Realms roster <clears throat> in Warham the Old World. Let's see what these rare units have to offer. First up is the Lion Chariot of Crace. It's got good weapon skill, strength, wounds and leadership. It's a heavy chariot on a 50 by 100 mil base, but it only comes in a unit size of one. So you've got hand weapons. Cracian Great Blades, yes, the ones that strike last. It's got claws and fangs from the lions and an armor save of four plus. So a little bit more durable than the Tyrannoc Chariot. Okay, special rules, close order, elven reflexes, valor of ages, all the usual stuff. Impact hits, D6, just like the, the um, Tyrannoc Chariot. So, which is kind of interesting. I m thought it, maybe it would get have a bit more. But, um, you know, it's pretty standard for a chariot. It is stubborn, so the first break test unit will automatically fall back in good order instead. does cause fear. does have first charge as well, so the target unit will be disrupted. And they have the lion cloaks. So improve armor value by one to a maximum of two. So it's going to get a three plus armor save against missile weapons. It's a fairly pricey unit. It's nearly the cost of two Tyrannoc chariots with not much more durability. So it's got a four plus armor save instead of a five plus, but it's still toughness four and four wounds on its own. So whereas before you had the Tyrannot Chariots, four of them in a unit, that's 16 wounds. This thing on its own, it's toughness four, four wounds with, a, with only an extra one armor save. Heavy Chariots can be tricky to use, right? They really only shine on the charge but they can easily be focused down because they're a unit of one. It's a cool looking miniature, there's no doubt. I mean, it does look wicked, two white lions pulling a chariot. But I just think there are better choices to spend points on in this category. Um, so, yeah, it's... And, and do you know what? Even if you took it as a mount, because it can be a, a character mount, it can't fly, so you do lose a lot of you know, mobility, so you go, why would you take this over a griffin, let's say? Yeah. So, looks cool, and take one because of the rule of cool, but not sure it's the most competitive choice. Right, Lothan Skycutter. Right, heavy chariot, 60 by 100 base. Unit size of one. It's got hand weapons, cavalry spears, short bows, wicked claws, and an armor saver 4+. All right, it can take an eagle eye bolt thrower. This is a 24-inch range bolt thrower. Strength 5, AP minus 3, cumbersome. It does have the multiple wounds, D3. Impact hits D3 plus 1, right? So charging into combat does lose some impact hits. Swift stride. It's got good mobility. Fear. Flies 10. Flying heavy chariot. It's so only 15 points per model, more than a Tyrannoc chariot. So as a flying heavy chariot, this is an interesting choice. Doesn't have the damage output of the Lion Chariot in combat. But it does offer a decent ranged option with the Eagle Eye Bolt Thrower. And it can fly, means it can hide behind enemy lines, it can shoot when it needs to, it can charge over enemy units when a good opportunity appears. It's definitely worthy of consideration. The downside for me is I'm not a big fan of the aesthetic in this. Like, I like my fantasy stuff, but this, like, flying chariot thing pulled by, a uh, yeah. It just not for me aesthetically. I think it's interesting. I think if you don't mind this and you want to put it in your army, I think there's some interesting things you can do with it. It's not like an automatic, uh, don't touch this thing. I just don't really like how it looks in the army. It just doesn't kind of fit the rest of the army. And this is one of these models that came in the 8th edition. And we saw this in a number of cases in 8th edition where they brought this new big big model into the range and it just didn't quite fit the rest of the range. So, yeah, this one, not not for me. But if you, if you don't mind it, I think there's some interesting stuff you could do with it. Sisters of Avalon. Good weapon skill, ballistic skill, initiative and leadership. They're regular infantry, 25 by 25. Hand weapons, bow of Avalon. We know how good this one is. We talked about this before already. Magic attacks and light armor. Can take a champion. Magic items on the high sister up to 50 points. 
Not to one unit can be an ambusher. Yeah, held in reserve. No thanks. Or stubborn. First break test, uh, the unit will automatically fall back in good order instead. Right, they have the arrows of Isha. So, you know, any bow, including long bows, short bows, war bows. Um, you've got evasive once per turn during the enemy shooting phase. Fall back good order. Instead of um, uh, before the enemy shoots at it, ignores cover. Immune to psychology, open order. Skirmishes, strikes first. Sisters of Avalon are four points per model more than a normal elven archer with light armor. All right, but they gain for those for those four points model more. They gain plus one weapon skill, plus one ballistic skill, plus one initiative, as well as all the special rules for ignores cover, evasive, you know, and all of that. All right, strikes first. Okay, so overall, I will always, nearly always, try and take a sister's unit in most of my army lists. There's no doubt, the shooting is good. 30-inch volley fire, magical attacks, combined with the AP-1 and Armour Bane 2, with Arrows of Isha. The main downside is the strength, and therefore low toughness targets would normally be the best choice. They're also decent in combat against low toughness troops as well. They've got high initiative, they strike first, they've got Ithilmar weapons, so they get to re-roll um, rolls of one. Um, but they, again, they lack the strength and AP to deal with more serious threats. However, if taking the Sisters of Avalon and then you take a Handmaiden to join them, you get the plus one to hit, which is great because they've already got the high ballistic skill, but they get the plus one to wound. This massively mitigates their issue of strength because it's a flat plus one to wound. It's not plus one to strength. It's a plus one to wound. That's big when you look at that to wound table. So now they have value against those tougher units even while they um even in combat because it just it's a plus one to hit and a plus one to wound right so this becomes quite a dangerous unit you know and add that to their to their shooting um you know their their ap minus one the armor being two and so on this is a this is a good unit i like sisters of Avalon. missile units in the game right now <clears throat> have Overall, I think a lower impact than maybe previously, by and large. But when you can give them buffs like this, this is when they start to shine. I personally avoid the ambushes, as I said before. It can work cool, but a series of bad rolls can see the unit delayed when you need when you really need it. Stubborn's a good rule because if you get caught by an enemy charge from a more serious unit, then um, you know, that can certainly help out. But for every 15 models that don't take Stubborn, essentially you get a free sister, which is another shot. So, you know, that's definitely something to consider. But yeah, Sisters of Avalon, really nice. Right, Flame Spire Phoenix. It's a monstrous creature. It's got good weapon skill, strength, toughness, and wounds. It's a 50 by 100 mil base. Comes with wicked claws and it has blazing plumage. So it's got a five plus save. No options. Comes with blessing of Azurian. Five plus ward save against flaming attacks. Yeah, okay, whatever. Fear. It does flaming attacks. Okay. Fly 10. That's nice. All right, it's large target. Stomp attacks too. All the good stuff for monsters. Swift stride. Makes it more mobile. All right, but it has from the ashes. When it dies, you roll a d6. On a 1 or 2, it's immediately removed from play. On a 3 to 5, it explodes. It hits every enemy unit in base contact. And that unit takes d6, strength 3, AP minus 1 hit. So not the strongest attacks, but there's d6 of them, and they are AP minus 1. And then you remove the model. On a 6, the phoenix immediately recovers d3 wounds. You've got to be lucky to get that, but the explosion's not bad. The other thing you get is Wake of Fire. So when you move over an enemy unit, that enemy unit suffers D6, Strength 4, AP minus 1 hits. That's pretty nice too. So, it's not a cheap monster. It's definitely worthy of consideration. It's fairly mobile, flies 10 inches. The ability to, to damage enemy units as it does a flyby um, is nice. Um, but as a character mount, 
I would prefer the Frost Heart Phoenix, personally. Being fairly good in combat could seriously threaten backline units. All right, so you fly over them, damage an enemy infantry unit on the way, and then go into an enemy missile infantry unit. They're not going to have strong attacks back or into a war machine. Um, which combined with, if you get caught out when you do that, and then it does die, it will blow up and, and do damage to the units it's in combat with. So, you know, there's value there. The flaming attacks is a key part of the monster. The problem is the value of flaming attacks tends to be very situational. There are very few units out there that have the flammable special rule. So the value of flaming attacks, which is the key part, I think is 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 in question. But I do think with From the Ashes, with Wake of Fire, with what it can do, there is value of consideration there. But I wouldn't use the Flame Spire as the, as the character mount personally. The Frost Heart Phoenix, and I also really love the colours of this one. Um, good weapon skill, strength, toughness, wounds, and attacks. It's a monstrous creature, the same. Uh, this time it has frozen plumage, so it's got a 4 plus armor save, so slightly better armor save than the Flame Spire. Okay, this time it's got all the same stuff fear, um, fly, large target, stomp attack, swift stride, but it, this time it comes with Blizzard Aura. Blizzard Aura is amazing. Enemy models in base contact become strike last. That's really good. Frost Heart Phoenix is 35 points per model, more than the Flame Spire. You get plus one weapon skill, plus one strength, plus one toughness, a weird minus one initiative. So somehow the Flame Spire has more initiative than the Frost Heart. They're the same type of monster. Okay. Uh, and plus one leadership, which overall seems like good value. Though still an expensive monster. The lower initiative is offset by Blizzard Aura because enemy models in base contact strike in last. Overall, I prefer to take a Frost Heart Phoenix, as I think the Blizzard Aura is amazing. This monster also makes for a good mount choice. It's 30 points cheaper than a Moon Dragon, but it's going to give you this Blizzard Aura. Um, you know, so as a as a character mount. You know, like I said, I would I would normally be going for a Star Dragon, right? So the Star Dragon, that would be 85 points cheaper than a Star Dragon. So um, Frost Heart Phoenix, definitely worthy of consideration. It kind of sits points-wise in between the Griffin and the and the Dragon, but you know, it does offer um, does offer something unique with this Blizzard Aura, and I think that that can be quite good, particularly if you were up against a another army that had pretty good initiative and stuff like that, making them strike last um is is um is very good the biggest downside is in the rare category there's many other choices but for me this is a unit that i would always always be worthy of consideration whether on its own whether as a mount um uh, you know it should be it should be considered if this has a role in um in your army list next up great eagles good weapon skill that's kind of it monstrous creature 50 by 50 base. Unit size of 1. It's got Wicked Claws. It's got the Serrated Maw, which we've seen before. And then no other options. Okay. It's Close Order, Fear, Fly 10, Stomp Attacks of 1, and Swift Stride. I'm not a fan of Great Eagles. They feel like they shouldn't be in the rare category, given what they can do, what they can offer with their rules. It feels like they should be in special choices. Um, they're not crazy expensive. You know, a unit of one, though, with three attacks at strength four and very low leadership in a highly contested category doesn't seem like great value. And I'd rather put those extra points into Sisters of Avalon or a Phoenix. You know, the Great Eagle is a character mount as well. It's the cheapest flying mount. However, again, I think there are significantly better options. A lone character on a flying mount, need to be maximizing their damage output with the aim of breaking or seriously damaging the units in the first round of combat when they charge in. And the eagle, for me, just doesn't hit hard enough or provide any other unique ability like the Frost Heart Phoenix or the Dragon. So yeah, maybe you would consider this as a mount for a mage if you want him to be flying around the, the battlefield, but you're going to be vulnerable. You're going to be vulnerable. So, yeah, Great Eagles, I'm, I'm not a fan. 
eagle claw bolt thrower. Do I need to mention that I'm a gun line player a lot of the time? Right, low stats there, as you'd expect. It's a war machine, 50 by 50 base, crew on 25 by 25. Right, it's a repeater bolt thrower. So you get 48 inch range, strength six, AP minus three. It's cumbersome, move or shoot, all the usual stuff. Multiple wounds two, rapid fire, through and through. That's where it pierces multiple ranks, right? But it does have an alternate um, firing mode, which is this rapid fire. So you fire the single bolt or you fire the rapid fire. The rapid fire is the same range. So it's strength four now. So you lose two strength and it's AP minus one instead of AP minus three. You do get armor bane one, which is nice. You get the same cumbersome move or shoot, but you get multiple shots. So you get D3 plus three shots. So a minimum of four shots instead of the single shot you get with through and through. And then you get hand weapons and light armor. So um, having two firing modes is always valuable. And then they get skirmishers, the elven reflexes, value of ages, right? Repeater bolt throwers, they've got the decent range, the dual firing mode. It's great because it gives you target flexibility. You're not sat there going, oh, I need to target this because this is I've only got a single shot and it's high strength and everything else. With the multiple firing modes, you can go, do you know what? I just need some extra shots onto that unit and I'm going to fire it at this infantry unit because I need more casualties there. All right? So it just it's that flexibility. It's not the best for killing monsters, even with the single shot mode, but it can have good value against the monstrous cavalry and infantry. I always try and fit one or even two into a lot of army lists. It's not crazy expensive for a war machine, but it does massively depend upon the size of the army list you're taking, what else is in the army list, and in particular, what else you're taking in the rare category. You take a Phoenix and some Sisters of Avalon, you're running out of points pretty quickly. So um, that is definitely a consideration. But overall... Um, Again, another worthy choice in the rare category where you should be thinking, does this have a role in the army? Um, I should be thinking about whether I take this one or not, unlike some of the others. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the army roster for the High Elves, but not the end of the faction focus, because just like the other ones, we will be taking a look at magic items. We're going to be comparing some units we're going to be looking at a couple of sample army lists, fun, not competitive meta army lists, and then some units that maybe we'll see in the future because we've seen them elsewhere in Warhammer fantasy lore, either in video games or in previous um, editions of the High Elf book. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Let me know why in the comments down below. And as always, if you want to see more content, hit that subscribe button. It's free for you to do takes a few seconds to click that button. It's just below the video. Thank you for that in advance. You've been watching The Ghost Owl. Tune back in as we take a look at some of the High Elf magic items.